Welcome to another episode of China Update, where I provide you with the most up-to-date political, economic, and geostrategic analysis on the world's number two economy. My name is Tony. Let's jump in. Happy Friday, everybody. We begin today's episode with our ongoing coverage of China's growing trade tensions with the West, fueled in part by oversupply, subsidies, and weak domestic demand. This week, the EU Chamber of Commerce released a report titled "Riskful Thinking: Navigating the Politics of Economic Security." In an interview about the report with Hong Kong-based South China Morning Post, the head of the chamber, Jens Eskulad, was blunt about the report's political implication. "Quote: Something will need to change because Europe cannot just accept that strategically viable industries constituting the European industrial base are being priced out of the market. It is hard for me to imagine that Europe will sit by quietly and witness the accelerated deindustrialization of Europe because of the externalization of low domestic." Demand. Demand in China. End quote. He explained that China's focus on the supply side to drive economic growth, as highlighted by upbeat exports in the first two months of the year, is creating problems in Europe and elsewhere as domestic industries are being crowded out. Quote, in terms of alleviating some of this pressure, there needs to be perhaps a little bit more focus on the demand side in China to create that demand that will make China less of a perceived threat. End quote. None of these comments and their political implications will be surprising to regular China Update viewers, but we also know that this building crisis is extremely difficult to defuse. Quote, Unfortunately, I don't think the trade tensions between China and the EU can easily be resolved. The growth strategies of the two economies are clearly incompatible, especially when it comes to the relative roles of manufacturing in each. Both economies suffer from weak domestic demand. Which means that both economies will be especially hurt by a further rise in global trade tensions, and this will only exacerbate the specific problems between the two. End quote. EU officials still remember what China's steel sector did to European firms over a decade ago. Now it seems the overcapacity is so bad that the sector is in distress in China itself. UK-based The Financial Times reports that steel exports are at an eight-year high. And some exporters started cutting prices after the two sessions because there was not the stimulus some had hoped for. In the first two months of this year, Chinese exports increased 32.6 percent against the year earlier to 15.9 million tons, the highest since 2016 for the period, according to figures from the National Bureau of Statistics. Analysts believe Chinese steel exports are set to match or exceed levels from last year. When exports rose to about 90 million tons, the highest level in seven years, as China struggles to stimulate its economy and efforts to cut production look insufficient, Chinese financial media outlet Yitai reports this week too that there has been a surge in defaults among steel traders. The situation has become so bad, the outlet writes, that after the Lunar New Year period, the Wuhan Metals Material Circulation Association issued a warning. Cautioning companies to be wary of the risks associated with advance payments and pre-orders, reports suggest that some traders have collected payments without placing orders, effectively embezzling funds, sometimes up to hundreds of millions of yuan. Industry analysts believe that the situation is the result of multiple factors, including the economic downturn, reduced demand, and of course overcapacity. However, experts in China's financial system would point out that this is a clear example of how Chinese surpluses are often more a consequence of weak domestic demand than of efficient production. Because of declining domestic demand, Chinese steel exports must rise even when production declines. Next up, China's local fiscal crisis appears to be getting worse by the week. If you're enjoying today's episode of China Update, don't forget to hit the like button. Liking, sharing, and subscribing are all helps for the channel. And for anyone who can go that extra mile and help me keep China Update financially sustainable, Patreon and Buy Me a Coffee links are in the description below. This is a lot of work, but all your support are all incredible sources of motivation. So thank you so much, everybody. For the ongoing support. Next up, China's local fiscal crisis has been a slowly building mess we've been following for some time now. In a long piece published this week called "Local Governments Struggle to Tackle Mountain of Hidden Debt," Chinese financial media outlet Sai Xin explains that local governments across China have been rushing to implement a debt reduction plan outlined by the Politburo in July of last year that involves defusing the debt risks of their financing vehicles. And bringing hidden liabilities out of the shadows onto their official books, 
Although many regions have successfully issued special refinancing bonds to replace some of their hidden borrowings, overall progress on debt resolution has been slow amid uncertainty over the viability of many local government financing vehicles, reports the outlet, as well as concern among banks that they will be piled with debt that won't be repaid pushing their non-performing loans higher and risking their ability to meet regulatory targets. The Tsaisen article further explains that one of the main instruments being used to repay hidden debt in this round of debt resolution is special refinancing bonds. On balance sheet, local government bonds whose proceeds are used to repay outstanding hidden debt. Issuance has stepped up significantly since early October, after the Ministry of Finance launched a special refinancing bond swap program. A source who works for an economic development zone in West China, however, told the outlet, quote, The core issue now is that we can't make our interest payments, end quote, noting that without new financing, the fiscal revenue of the region can only sustain government agencies' day-to-day operations and preferential policies for attracting businesses. He said his local government has stopped making all other payments, including those to project developers, in order to ensure it can meet interest payments on outstanding local government financing vehicle debt. Later in the piece, Tsai Sin writes that the central government ordered provincial officials to compile a list of local government financing vehicles owned by local authorities in their jurisdictions. The local lists were required to be sent to the state council by the end of June 2023. The national list contains nearly 18,000 local government financing vehicles, according to sources speaking to the outlet, and they are only allowed to borrow new debt to repay the principal on outstanding debt now. Then yesterday, the same outlet, Tsai Sin, and remember this is a Chinese-based, Chinese-staffed publication. These are not stories from foreigners out of the country. Tsai Sin published another concerning piece, writing that some cash-strapped local governments in China are taking advantage of expanding jurisdictional reach to target lucrative cases involving private businesses in other regions. Quote, in an effort to find alternative ways to replenish government coffers. End quote. This emerging trend in the last several years is known as distant water fishing among China's legal circle. Quote, it represents a significant threat to the private sector. End quote. According to Xu Xin, a law professor at the Beijing Institute of Technology, when using this method, local authorities typically take on cases involving large sums of money and parties with substantial assets. This gives them the opportunity to hand down handsome fines and confiscate assets to generate income. Of course, this is a huge red flag, essentially squeezing private enterprises to meet the massive fiscal hole in their balance sheets. Quote, In the past two years, local finances have become severely strained in some provinces. The income from fines and confiscations in criminal cases has in effect eased local government's fiscal pressure, and some people wonder why private enterprises lack confidence in the legal environment. End quote. Okay, that is today's episode of China Update. Thank you so much, everybody, for watching. Have a good Friday, have a lovely, restful weekend, and I will see you all tomorrow.